All right, everyone, welcome back to ECE 2002. Uh, today, we're going to be covering chapters 16 and 17, so we're going to jump another chapter ahead. And the focus of this is going to be the impulse response. So we talked a little bit about this last time. Uh, when we are looking at any given function, recall that when we convolve one function with another, or actually any given function can be represented as a sum of impulse responses with a coefficient or a constant attached to it that's equal to the value of the function at that point where that time shifted delta function is right we're just summing all these delta functions together and giving all the different delta functions different height based on what the function value is at that point um, so what we're actually going to do now is we're going to take a singular impulse response at zero and then once we define that, we're going to use that to see what the response of that system is to any input. Because if we know what it does for a singular delta function, we can just modify it effectively and see what it does for any signal that is just a composition of delta functions, right? Okay. So we're going to define what the impulse response actually is and the step response, because as it turns out, we can't easily define the impulse response without the step response. And this is the unit step function, by the way. In order to justify what we're doing, we have to define what an LTI system is, linear time invariant system. And then we're going to show you guys how uh, impulse responses actually work. And then we're going to derive the impulse response from the step response and show you how to operate the thing. Okay. So how to find it and operate it. All right, so fun fact, I guess, um, important note here. So chapter 16 and 17 still need some pretty serious edits. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I started making all the convolution stuff, and I put the impulse response after convolution because uh, to me it only made sense to talk about an impulse response after you even know what a convolution is. Otherwise, you don't know what a convolution with anything is. Right, so the way we had it uh, done, um, established before was we kind of build into this from a circuit's perspective and sort of develop the impulse response first and then say, oh, hey, this thing we found, by the way, you can apply it for a generalized operation called the convolution. I think the way we have it now is better, but that being said, uh, the chapters 16 and 17 do need some work. So there are some errors and, and stuff in there. If you see things, uh, that you notice right away that I haven't pointed out, please point them out on the bright space for others so that we're all on the same page. Um, and uh, don't take the chapter 17 too seriously. So the numerical methods are not going to be on a quiz or an exam. Okay. The only thing that's going to be on an exam is the impulse response and how to use it, but we're going to be applying it so much in so many different areas that it's not going to be a standalone item necessarily. Um, it's going to slowly become part of a larger uh, phenomenon uh, that we refer to as the Laplace transform and its associated uh, version in the, in the other domain, which is the transfer function. Okay, so know that this is going somewhere and know that these two chapters are a little little goofy in terms of the way they're written because they're not where they're where they were originally all right that's enough of that okay so when we talked about operations on a system before when we described our system our system was a differential equation operating on for example the voltage of a capacitor or something okay and we called that x of t, and we applied a differential equation to it, and it was equal to some forcing function vn. All right. Now we're sort of turning this on its head when we talk about x and y. Um, our input now to the system is going to be whatever that forcing function is. This makes a little bit more sense just from a, a heuristic standpoint. My input to the system should have an in on it, right? <laughs> so that's good. Um, my system, however, becomes something quite different. It's actually a uh, impulse response integral. So what we're doing is we're going to be taking that input 
convolving it with the impulse response of the system, what happens to the system when I put in just a single impulse, and out will pop the variable in question based on the differential equations, which determined what this impulse response was. If this sounds confusing, it's really not. We're just switching stuff around, okay? So just note that this x of t is not the same as this x of t that you had from before or in differential equations. Um, we're still going to use these operations, right? It's just x and y are just simple placeholders for how we think about operations in general. And so they're not always going to be defined the same way for every single operation, right? And in this case, they've actually switched with each other um, for inputs and outputs. All right. So... How, do, how are we able to even do this? Well, it's because we have a special kind of system, a linear time invariant system that we're able to accomplish this with the help of convolution. And we'll talk about what an LTI system is. So that's what allows us to be able to do this. And why do we even want to do this? Why This is just making something that was complicated, differential equations, even more complicated. What the heck, Art? Well, uh, we actually want to define our output as particular operating points given a specific VN or IN, uh, to our L RLC system. So instead of having to mess with this thing inside of a differential equation, we actually would prefer to work with it as the input uh, to something, and then the output was the thing that we were looking for all along. We generally want our outputs to be the things we're looking for, right? We don't want our out our, the things we're looking for, i.e. Uh, VCT, for example, or I'm sorry, e.g., VCT, for example, uh, to be the thing that we're putting into the system because then we have to take apart that that whole construct, that whole differential equation in order to even find the, the sucker. So this is a much better way to solve the problem if we have this piece of the puzzle already. As it turns out, in order to get that piece of the puzzle, we have to do a little bit of this stuff over here first, and then we can do this for any input that we want and it will be nice and well-defined for us. So that's where we're going with this. Um, and then once we have this uh, impulse response framework in place, it becomes a vehicle for us to describe systems in other spaces, in other domains. So right now we're in this time domain, right? Everything's depending on time. What happens if I wanted to look at things from a frequency perspective? Well, if I have an impulse response and I know how a system behaves for any kind of input, and I can de define it nicely, then I can see how any kind, of in, uh, any kind of system behaves in a frequency type of way, later on with the Laplace transform, with this piece of information. This gives me a blueprint for how my system performs. And so when I transform that into the new space, uh, what we're going to see is that um, it becomes a very convenient way of analyzing the system's frequency uh, behaviors, okay? So that's what's going to happen here. That's, that's the motivation. I know it's a really long answer to the three lines of green that I have here, but that's, that's what, what we have. And it's important to understand the context, otherwise this is, just sounds goofy. So recall from before that we had uh, our input was uh, x to differential equation. And when we wrote this out, um, we saw that our x of t here was... Uh, whatever those variables in question were. Um, so we're, we've come a long way uh, now in trying to solve this problem because now we have a new tool for doing this regularly with different values of yt and finding our xt's that we want back out. Okay, so our shortcut method for solving ODE systems for any forcing function uses h of t, and we define h of t as follows. It is the output when the input is the impulse function. Hence, it is called the uh, impulse response function or just impulse response. Because as you can see down here, this is my definition of this. This is the impulse response. If I were to make my input be that delta function, then my output would have to be h because of what we know about the delta function. Convolution with the delta function always just produces, it's an identity, right? Uh, just reproduces that function. And so 
it characterizes the entire system for us. It characterizes the entire RLC circuit for us once we have that piece. It's like the holy grail of the circuit. Now, if you change the circuit, the impulse response is going to change. If you change uh, the initial conditions, it can really screw things up too. So you have to be very careful. But if you change the forcing function alone, then all you have to do is just put in a new forcing function here and con uh, convolve it, and you'll get the output out. But you say, all right, convolution is this complicated integral. I have to do t minus tau, and then a tau, and then I got to pull the t's out, and I got to integrate the, the thing, and it's all over the place. Well, as it turns out, convolution has very nice patterns um, in, in certain domains, and when we see the Laplace transform, uh, convolution, when we transform it becomes just multiplication and so all those nasty integrals go away in the frequency domain with the laplace transform uh, which i think we talk about in the next chapter so know that there is hope on the horizon here this this operation becomes much more simple for us in the future and it becomes very easy for us to calculate this output once we have one final tool in place and then we don't have to really deal with the ODEs hardly at all anymore after that once we know our impulse response and once we have the Laplace transform as a tool to guide our process okay so it's changing the whole game LTI systems let's define these really quick so LTI systems are linear time invariant systems there's two pieces to this the linear part. So for any input, if I take two different inputs and I scale them, I get what their outputs would have been individually and also scaled, added together. So it's preserved under addition and scaling. Okay, that's what that means. Time invariant is the harder one for most people to process. And what this means is that if I shift something uh, for my input, it also shifts my output. So it doesn't actually do anything to my, um, it, it's time invariant because when I shift time, it just shifts time in, in the output. I don't get a different output necessarily based on a time shift. Okay. It doesn't really change my output. It just delays it. Um, and so we call that time invariant. So you can actually prove these properties uh, for RLC systems. It's a little complicated to do, but let's take a look at what happens in Chapter 9 uh, for these two kind of operations. So we can kind of prove to ourselves, you know, uh, heuristically at least, um, not a real proof, but we'll kind of prove to ourselves that these two things are true for our systems. Okay, so recall in chapter 9, we looked at this RC circuit. It's a very simple RC circuit. And we derived a differential equation for it. We had this nice uh, solution. And we ended up with this final solution. Okay. Now, what would happen if I changed my forcing function? Here was my forcing function before, right? So if, as I multiply it by a certain amount, well, let's do the multiplication second. If I added another forcing function to it, then what would happen? Well, I just do those two pieces together, right? I have those two pieces of, of forcing function, if they were in fact different, not just two constants, right? They just add the constants together. It's kind of trivial. But let's say I had like two different decay rates that I, that I wanted to put as inputs. Well, then my output for the system, VC, in terms of our, our new construct, right, for inputs and outputs, then my new output would, would have that decay and, and then the other decay added together. So it's just if you have uh, two pieces going in added together, you're going to get two pieces um, going out added together. And the homogeneous solution would adapt accordingly to balance out that equation, uh, as you can see here. So as I plug in zero, it's going to adapt its coefficient based on the different inputs that I put in there. Similarly, if I have a scaling of this, it should be easy to see that if I scale Vn by, say, one-fifth, this is going to come in handy, by the way, later on, if I scale Vn by one-fifth, 
then I'm also scaling my output by one fifth. Notice all these little fives here. If I scaled Vn by one, one over five, my uh, particular solution would become one and my coefficient a would become negative one. And so just by simply scaling my input, I can scale my output, my entire solution, my entire output. Now we know that that's the output here Right? The output here is made up of particular and homogeneous solutions, but when you put it all together, when you add up that total solution, it works out. It works out to have this rule in play. Okay, And with time shifting, the rule also applies as well. So if I were to time shift everything here, if instead this Vn, let's leave it as a, as a 5, okay, but let's let it start at t equals 1. Hmm? If it starts at t equals 1, then my particular solution would start at t equals 1. It would be this, instead of u of t here, technically this is 5 u of t, right? Because it's for all t greater than or equal to 0, and it's 0 otherwise. You guys remember this, I hope. If I made this instead, oh, that's too big of an eraser. If I made this instead u of t minus 1, then what happens? Well, then my output becomes uh, 5 of, oops. 5 times u of t minus 1, right? It really doesn't do much for me. And so when I come down here, though, when I look at my total solution, finding that coefficient to my homogeneous solution, even with the initial conditions that I have, I see that this function here is actually going to become 5 times u of t minus 1, i.e. it's shifted 1 to the right. It's delayed by... Um, by one. So then I would end up with a final solution here for a of minus five times u of t minus one. So my coefficients here and here are both just time lagged by one. Does that make sense? I hope so. So that time invariance carries through. The time invariance that we put in the forcing function carries through to both the homogeneous and particular solution. Should be self-evident. Maybe it's not. Otherwise, just take my word for it, okay? All right, so here's the general procedure. And note that we're generally, generally assuming that our initial condition is at rest. This is not always going to be the case, okay? And we'll, we're going to have to be careful when it's not. But for most of the time for us, we're going to assume that it's at rest. And if we have conditions at rest, we're going to be in good shape. Okay, so uh, what we do is we first build the ODE, just like we did before. Nothing changes there. But instead of some whatever for the forcing function, we're going to pick a very special forcing function. We're going to pick a forcing function that is the unit step function. That is uh, u t is equal to our input. So that would be our vn of t or whatever. Okay. Then what we're going to do is once we've solved for the response to that system, that is to say once we solve for, for example, vct, the total solution when uh, Vn, again, for example, is equal to ut. Then we have Vc as a response to that unit step function. And now we call this, this version of Vct, or, or I, whatever, whatever it happens to be, whatever variable we're looking for, that's our impulse response. And so, I'm sorry, that's our, our step function response. And what we do from there is we differentiate that step function response to yield the impulse response function. Recall that when you differentiate the step response function, it, uh, or I'm sorry, the step function, you get the, uh, the impulse function, right? And so too, when we differentiate our step function response, we get the impulse response. 
So what we do on the front end matches what we do on the back end. And it's not convenient for us to put in a infinitely high impulse into our system. Uh, so we just say, well, what would happen if I just flipped the switch and left it on? What happens to my system then? And every signal is essentially flipping the switch on by a certain amount and then adding together different versions of those amounts. And so by knowing what happens to the system when I just flip the switch on for uh, ever at unit one, I'm able to compile and composite a solution to everything that I could possibly input to, into there, any type of signal, even infinite, uh, uh, even continuous ones, because I have the Dirac Delta function at my disposal. So now you can uh, input any forcing function, X of T, and convolve it with that impulse response that you've derived and observe the output for the system. And that's generally what we're going to do. Okay, so let's take an example. Uh, from chapter 17, we're kind of jumping forward here because, again, the book is a little bit out of order. I apologize. So if we um, look at the solution in 9, in chapter 9 for this, this is our RC circuit, right? Uh, notice here we're solving for VC in this case. Again, just, just a placeholder example here. This is just a toy example for us. Um so we see that our solution to this differential equation, let me erase all this garbage. Our solution to this differential equation is here for an input equal to five, okay? So we know that VCT is equal to, I'm just gonna actually erase this and lift it out of here. There. So we know that this is equal to that when Vn is equal to 5 times the unit step function. Well, it's not too much of a stretch then to just say our unit or our step response, our unit step response would be just a factor of 5 or 1 over 5 times this entire expression. So we just multiply this by 1 fifth because we already know this. We could have derived it again, and in practice you will have to derive it uh, for a system, but since we already have it, we'll use it as, as an example to, to make it handy. So then VCT is equal to minus E to the minus T over 10 plus one for all T greater than or equal to zero. And from here on out, it's really better for us to write this as UT. Right, we say this for t greater than or equal to zero, but really what we mean is this times a step function. When the input is equal to just a step function, notice here that the coefficient is a silent, a little tacit one. Okay, so now what do we do? Well, we take, now we take that derivative. So the derivative of this, don't get confused, we're not turning this into current. Um, we take the derivative of this and we end up with the following. Minus, actually it's plus, 1 over 10, e to the minus t over 10. The plus 1 goes away. ut goes long for the ride. And this is our response and let me write it this way, actually. So this is equal to VCT when VNT is equal to delta T. Okay, so by taking the derivative of the expression from when we had the step response, we end up with the output when the input is equal to that uh, delta function. All right, so in summary, I've made this little table here for you. Um, this is just for this particular example, right? So what we did was we looked at the ODE for the system, and we looked at what happened when our input to that system, our VN to that system, was UT. And sometimes it might be IN. You know, keep that in mind. And sometimes this might 
be uh, current as well. It just depends on the, the nature of the ODE and what you're trying to find and, and what's going on. But we had a, a specific input that we wanted to look for. That was UT. We derived what VC would be for that. We solved the ODE for our step function. Um, and then we produce an output that is the step response. So our step response is defined as VC, in this case VC, when the input was the step function. And it always is going to be the step function that we're going to use to, to find that step response. Okay, from there we took the step response and we took the derivative of that step response to make the impulse response because recall that the imp impulse function is just the derivative of the step function. And so our impulse response is just the derivative of the step response. So then this HT that we have now, which is uh, what you would get if you put in theoretically a unit impulse into the system as your VN. This defines our system entirely, and we talked about why that's true with, with convolution, because convolution is just a bunch of impulses. And so once it's defined our system, for any input that we want to do from, from then on out, for any V in that we choose in this example, then we have the output readily available to us in the form of a convolution with that impulse response. Okay, so what we're going to do next is we're going to look at the textbook. So see, uh, no, textbook, see the homework. Look at, look at the homework, actually. So homework set 17 is, if you can do that, you can do any of the problems that would be relevant to a quiz. Um, the other uh, homework set associated with this lecture is... Uh, 16, obviously. Um, these problems are a little bit easier, uh, mostly because they're slightly simpler circuits. That's fun to say. <laughs> but you have L, uh, RL circuits, RC circuits, uh, RL circuits, R, RC circuits, and then finally get an LRC here in part E. So if you can kind of do these um, RLC circuits, you know, easily enough, um, you'll be in good shape. If I was to ask you a question on, on, a, on a quiz, I'd probably lean towards one of these more simple ones, um, just because I don't, uh, I'm not trying to play gotcha on a final or something like that. Um, it would look probably much more like, um, like this question here. Okay, so just a little heads up on that. Okay, so we know from before that our differential equation for this system is defined as follows. Okay, we could rederive it here, but there's really no need because we've already done this problem in an earlier problem set. So you should know how to do that. Uh, we plug in our values for L, R, and C, noting that the specific values that we choose will determine what kind of polynomial we have spit back out at us, and therefore our lambda values are directly associated with uh, what kind of inputs we have for our different circuit elements. Okay, and it also determines what kind of dampening we have in this system, which, which dictates the behavior and the shape of the function. So it's a big deal. So we have to make sure we do this step carefully. What we end up with is a double solution at lambda equals minus 10. Uh, both of these are, are real solutions. Um, so that should give us a, a critically damp system. So what we see then is that we have a... Uh, homogeneous solution, which has the repeated roots. So we do two coefficients. In the past, we've actually used A here and A here, and then we used B for these. Um, it really doesn't matter what letters you use, to be honest. Um, but if if we were being consistent with our previous notation, that's what we would have. Um, and in any case, from here, what we have is uh, that that exponential form e to the minus 10 e to the minus or excuse me e to the lambda t uh, and then that extra t goes along for the ride with the repeated root okay so then here's where we take a little detour okay everything up to this point is the same
Okay, this is all old stuff right here. Right here, we're changing it up. We're going to actually solve for a particular solution when the step with the, uh, an input of the step, uh, step function. I can't talk today. So what we have is 1 is equal to our equation here. And because it's a step function, uh, we just have a constant. And so we let our vc particular equal a in this case. When we plug a back into this differential equation, we set it equal to 1. And more accurately, we actually should say we set it equal to ut, right? It's, it's equal to 0 up until t equals uh, 0. But uh, 1 will suffice for here because we, we are aware of where the jump actually occurs. And so when we solve this out, this goes away, this goes away, and we're left with a is equal to 1. And so that's our um, coefficient for, or actually, that is our particular solution. It's just equal to 1. Now, that's not it, though, right? Our particular solution is not the thing that we're looking for. What we're looking for is the total solution to our system when, the, uh, when we use the step function as an input. So we have to put this all together and then solve for our coefficients in the homogeneous solution now, given that this has been fixed by that step function. So now what we have is total, total system here, and we apply some initial conditions. So generally speaking, we're going to have uh, at rest conditions. And so if we're at rest, then one thing that we know right away is if we plug in a bunch of zeros in here, zero for t, zero for t, we end up with just b1 plus, oh, there's another zero here. So this all just goes away, b1 plus 1, right? And that's what we have here. b1 plus 1 is equal to zero because the system is at rest. And so b1 is equal to minus 1. Now... From here, we also know that the derivative of the voltage, again, this is lowercase, but we know that the derivative of the voltage is equal to zero as well. There's no current flowing initially. So for, as an initial condition, we can say, well, the derivative of that equation here must also be equal to zero at time t equals zero. So we take the derivative and we end up with this equation here. From there, we have uh, 0 is equal to 10, because this goes to 1, this goes to 1, and we're left with just b2 hanging out. Well, that's very convenient, actually, because uh, we, we know what b1 is, so we just need b2. Here it is. It's uh, minus 10. So now we have both of our coefficients, and we can write out... We kind of skipped a little bit of a step here, but we could write this out as uh, v... CT is equal to this line. And then we say, well, actually, VCT, in this particular case, when I've, when I've arranged for VN to be the step function, we call it something special. We call it ST. And then we take the derivative here with respect to T. And when we take the derivative, the 1 goes away. Um, the sign here changes. Um, and then when you get some cancellation, et cetera, et cetera, you end up with just this expression. You end up with just ht is equal to 100, t e to the minus 10t. So you have some, some nice cancellation going on there. Okay, so now what do we do with this dang thing? We have the impulse response. This is it. So what good is it? Well... Like we said before, we can take any input and convolve it with the impulse response and get the associated output or the specific VC for that input. Note that the VC here throughout the entire problem is, is changing. It's, it's, it's mutable, right? And the reason for that is we want it to be flexible for us. We want it to be something that when we change the input, we can change what the outputs are. And so this VC is not the same VC that we have here. Okay, just a note. All right, so when we plug all this together, we know how to do a convolution. We have 13e to the minus 4 tau, 
times the unit step function of tau times this 100 t e to the, uh, I'm sorry, t times e to the minus 10 t. And now it's just a, a calculus game. So the first thing you always want to try to do is pull out any factors that are exclusively functions of t and leave all the stuff inside, obviously you have to because you're integrating, that is a function of tau. So we do that here in these steps. And walking through what we see is uh, 13 comes out, 100 comes out, um, this t comes out, uh, insofar as we can make it, we break up the integral, right? Um, so that we can do that. And then once, uh, we also can pull out the uh, common factor here. That's this e to the minus 10t, right? Because that's just being multiplied to everything else. So we can just pull it out to the outside. And what we're left with is just two integrals. We're left with this integral here. And you guys remember what happens when uh, we have these step functions in there. It actually integrates from 0 to t. Um, and that's just because this and where'd it go? Actually, I should draw it this way. Let me zoom in a little bit. I don't know why I'm not zoomed in. And that's just because of this and this. This is so much better to read. And I, my eyes aren't squinting. You guys think it's small on your screen. It's even smaller on the iPad. I don't even know how I saw any of that. All right. So this and this set our boundaries so we can get rid of those. And we immediately get this. Um, you should recognize that by now. And unless you have something funky going on inside of here for your, for your time delay, you, you don't even need to think twice about it. Uh, as long as it says, you know, ut and ut, or I'm sorry, u tau and ut minus tau. So then from here, what we have is these two integrals. You should be able to solve these two integrals. This one's very easy to solve, right? We all should know how to do that one. Uh, this one you can either do by parts or you can have a, you know, a handy table or something, or a reference table. Um, if you want to keep your calculus book next to you, that's fine. If I give you something like this, um, I will probably give you the formula on the uh, quiz or exam. So you don't have to go look it up somewhere and it's like, oh, geez, what is that integral? Um, I don't find much value in, in having those memorized unless you really have a good memory. I don't. So I, I can't expect you guys to memorize stuff that I, I barely remember half the time anyway. Um, all right, so here's the final thing uh, that we end up with. We have VC, and this, again, should be lowercase, um, is equal to these three terms. This is just simplifying the, the final solution here. Um, and this confirms what we found in the last homework, actually. We've done something that's more convoluted to use something with convolution. Yeah. All right, All right. I'll, I'll get out of here. All right, so the next problem, uh, what it's doing in part B is it's repeating the same thing, and it seems kind of stupid, but we actually changed out the resistor value, which changes the system entirely, and so we have to recalculate our impulse response, unfortunately. And it's actually important that we do because the dampening has changed as well. We are now in the overdamped region. Um, and because of that, we have a new homogeneous form. Uh, mm, that's not right. That's totally wrong. So that's a typo there. Let me make sure. Uh, yeah, it looks like it didn't carry through. So that's good, at least. Sorry about that. Uh, there is no T here. Oof. I'm glad, I'm caught, uh, glad I caught that one. A um, little bit of a typo. Sorry about that, guys. There's a lot of typos in here we're going to find. Um, there hasn't been any copy editing of, of the homework stuff yet, right? Anyways, uh, my fault there. I, I think I actually wrote this one, so that's on me. So what we do is we, we walk the dog just like we did last time. We end up with the same kind of particular solution here. And our form, though, is, is quite a bit different because our form now is, our form now is this. And there's no T in here, right? There's no T in here because these exponents are different. 
just a typo. All right, so when we apply the initial conditions, we get sort of a different equation here. Uh, we actually have to apply both conditions, the first one being set the thing equal to zero uh, for t equals zero, and then set the thing equal to zero for uh, the derivative, I'm sorry, set the derivative equal to zero when t is equal to zero. And so we end up with two equations with two unknowns. We solve them. We know how to do that from like fifth grade, hopefully. And there you go. You end up with two new values. We resolve it to get our uh, step response. And then we take the derivative to get our uh, whoops, impulse response. Okay, same thing as before. We just take this impulse response and we can evolve it with whatever specified input we want. In this case, we're going to use the same input. And we do this convolution. And so the calculus, again, looks really similar. Um, there's really not too much change. It's actually a little bit simpler because we don't have that t up in front here, right? We didn't have that t minus tau. And uh, from there, what we do is we just solve away, um, and we end up with this, which is what we had in the previous homework as well. So let's see some of the differences here, what, what may have occurred um, in the process. Well, nothing, actually. This, this process holds no matter what kind of system I'm, or what kind of uh, conditions I have on my system for R, L, and C. So it's the exact same thing. We just had to be careful when we got to our, our characteristic equation and created our homogeneous form, everything else is the same. Everything. Uh, the final one, then, is obviously going into the underdamped region, right? So we start to get the wibble wobbles. Uh, and the reason for that is that we have these complex values here. Uh, notice that it is, in fact, just underdamped and not undamped because we have a complex value in here. It's a, it's a real plus a j value. So we're not sitting on the, uh, when we're looking here, we're sitting in this region, right, for our solutions. So they match up like so because they're complex conjugates of each other. As a review, recall that this was the critically damped region. We have double solution there. And then this was the overdamped was there and there. It's a very weird uh, pattern that it goes through. But you can, if you ever take um, complex analysis, it actually makes a lot more sense. Um, but uh, we'll do enough in this course that it, it'll, it'll, it'll jive with you a little bit. Okay, so that should do it for those. Um, okay, some, uh, some parting shots here uh, before we go. So chapter 17 is primarily about this numerical method. And I need to rework this chapter, to be honest, because I like numerical methods and they make sense. But in the context of the way that we've built from convolution, they're really not necessary because we already developed the tools that we need uh, for this. And so rederiving the calculus really isn't beneficial at this point. Um, so don't worry about the numerical methods as much. All you need to know is how to apply the tools that we have to generate a step response and an impulse response for a simple circuit. And at the, at the very, and really, it's just an RLC circuit. That's it. That's all you need to be able to do from this chapter. Uh, it is testable, though. So make sure you know it. Um, chapter 16 has some good stuff in it. Um, it has another graphical illustration of convolution, which I, I do like. Tom made this one. Um, and what it does is, oops, I don't have the textbook up. Okay, so I really like this graphic in this chapter. Um, what it's doing is it's showing you a, yet another illustration. If I've, if I've got some impulse response here that I've specified, and in this case, it's a very simple impulse response, right? It's really dumb. It's just this triangle that's decaying. That's it. It just decays from A to zero in time span B. Okay, it takes B seconds or whatever it is uh, to go down A. 
And although this is shaded, technically this is just this line, okay? Now, notice something interesting here is that just like our train example, when we hit this thing, we're actually, when we convolve these two, we're actually just making copies of H of T. And this has to do with the fact that every signal is just a bunch of deltas. And so because you're convolving with a bunch of delta functions, you're really, all you're doing is you're taking uh, copies. Recall that this times, I don't want to use X, I'll, I'll use H just to be clear, that this is just returning the value of H. And in fact, you know, if, if you just shifted this, it just returns shifted values of H, right? So all this is doing is shifting the, the values of H in accordance with our specified signal. And then it's doing that by scaling each output as we go through. So this is a nice discrete example of this process. And you're actually convolving here a discrete with a uh, continuous, but it really doesn't matter, right? We said that they were the exact same thing. This is just a sum of delta functions. And so nothing is really that complicated here. There's no difference, no difference between uh, discrete and continuous effectively. And so this is easy to do. This isn't the final solution. You should recognize readily um, that you're going to have to sum all of these together, right, to get that final version. Okay, so that's it for the book stuff. For next time, what I would like for you to do, I, I actually want you to read ahead a little bit. Or at the very least, I want you to look up some stuff online, either look up tutorials, look up the wiki page, something, but look up something on Laplace transform. And I have to be honest, it's, um, it's a little, mm, it's a little difficult to teach this because we haven't learned about the Fourier transform, the generalized version of the Laplace transform. I think that's okay. Um, but it makes it difficult to find good references because, you know, anytime you look up the Laplace transform, all they're going to tell you is, oh, it's just a Fourier transform, but yada, yada, yada. Um, that's true, but that doesn't help you understand the Laplace transform. <laughs> so try to find some kind of material that helps you read ahead in the book. If you want, that's fine. Um, the biggest picture that you need to have in your head going into next time is this. Okay. And what this is telling us is that now we've been working up here. If we have an impulse response for our system, then we know that for any input here, our output is determined by the convolution of that signal with our impulse response. But what the Laplace transform is going to do for us is going to take us to a new place. We've been working in this time domain. Um, domains, by the way, are just what your variable is running over. In this case, our variable is time. Our variable is time. Our variable is time, time, time. All right? Things happen in time. Well, not anymore. Not with the help of the good old frequency domain. Now everything is in terms of frequencies. Okay? And that's what we're going to do next time is we're going to convert everything over into this frequency domain. We don't know when stuff occurs as easily anymore unless we convert it back. But we do know what, at what frequency and what magnitude um, the amount of that frequency we're receiving for a given uh, signal, right? For a given f signal that we're looking at. So although we lose information, we don't really lose it. It's still there. It's packed away. Um, but although we don't have the information about time readily available, we do have the frequency information. I mean, technically, you have the frequency information in the time domain, right? You could trace out all the squiggles and try to find what frequencies are there, but it it's pretty darn difficult to do in the time domain, right? So we're going to develop a new tool next time that takes us to a new place. It's going to be an adventure. Okay, so grab your adventuring gear, um, grab your D and D manual. Um, I'll be you know I'll be your your game master for this one. 
Uh, we'll see some some monsters along the way. Um, I'm not sure, you know, this is kind of a prefabricated adventure, so, you know, let's all start at, like, level three. Roll your characters. Uh, I usually like to be a wizard, so there you go. All right. <laughs> That's... I know at least one of you plays D and D, okay? So I know this isn't lost on everyone. And and in case you don't know what D and D is, it's Dungeons and Dragons, and it's fantastic. Um, and I haven't played in in far too long. Anyways, I'll talk to you guys next time. Peace.